just to give you a little bit more background on, on, on myself. So I'm a California baby. I was born and raised in California. Uh, down in, I actually was born and raised uh, for part of my life in East LA. My parents came from Guatemala, so I'm the first one born here. So first gen uh, American. Uh, through a series of like really lucky and crazy things, I ended up going to college. I was supposed to be a mechanic, um, but life intervened. And I went to UCLA. And then from there, I changed my major 13 times. I was trying to figure out what to do. I started as a biologist. Uh, at one point, I think I was a classics major. And then I ended up, again, being a biologist in the end. So I, I did full circle. And I found out that one path was, uh, was sort of doing science and trying to get you know, therapeutics and drugs and medicine. And that the way you could do that is through science. And I got involved in basic research, preclinical research with animal models. Uh, and they told me that I could go get more education, get a PhD, and that they paid me for it. Um, and I grew up super poor. So the idea of having like a city income for a few years sounded amazing. Uh, so I ended up doing that. I came to Stanford, so my PhD was at Stanford. Um, and then I was going to go do you know, more training. Uh, I was actually going to go over to Harvard. And the guy ended up going to Texas. Uh, at the time, my partner, um, same-sex couple, my partner was like, I'm not going there. And then my mother, who's that tiny little Latin lady, was like, you're not going there. So in the end, I wasn't going there. So I ended up staying another year here in you know, the, the Bay Area. And that's where a lot of the work that I'll talk to you about today actually stemmed from. It stemmed from this gap year that I had between my PhD and the position that I have now. And basically, what I did is, instead of more training, um, UCSF, MIT, um, Harvard have these programs where once a year or every other year, they hire a recent grad, they throw about a million and a half dollars at you, and they go, go start a lab, just like a person who would have you know, eight years more training than you do. And th that's what they do. And a lot of times, you know, they do really, really well. Um, before, they used to recruit us away, and now UCSF has found a good way of keeping us there. So we usually just then end up having larger labs and being involved in you know, companies and consulting and all this stuff I'm learning about now. Um, but that's sort of my background, just so you guys know sort of where I come from. So I'm not the traditional scientist. I didn't grow up in a house where everyone's a scientist. I've just sort of learned along the way. I've never said no. I've always taken risks, and so far they're paying off. Uh, I'm gonna, there is going to be a little bit of data, and a lot of this stuff is preclinical, but I'm trying to keep it so that we can really have a conversation on it and more about what I think and where we're going rather than just like the data that I'm presenting. But I definitely want to sort of talk about a little bit of what's out in the news and everything so you guys understand that it's based on actual science, not just pseudoscience craziness. Okay. So my entire research career, my lab, all my students were focused on this sort of overarching question, which is this idea of aging. And people, especially in the Silicon Valley, are like terrified of this idea. As soon as you like hit 40, everything sort of breaks down. So I, no, you know what? I'm still in my 30s. I feel pretty good. A few gray hairs. That's all. No, you're right. Like, there's some changes here already, which is 30. Um, so I like starting with this schematic because it shows that it's a continuum. Um, and you start seeing, right, yeah, of course, there's changes. There's like gray hair and wrinkles, and we start losing our hair, and other things start sagging. And obviously, time is doing something to us. And before, it was just like people thought it's wear and tear. And now we know, no, it's environmental. There can be genes. A whole bunch of stuff control it. But it's a lot more controlled than we thought. And as soon as you understand that it's controlled as scientists, we're like, OK, let's decode it. Let's understand how it works. And if we figure out how it works, maybe we can tweak it to slow it, to reverse it, to do something. And what we think is that you can actually reverse it. So it's not like something that you can just prevent. We actually think you can get to be old, and we can reverse some function, make it younger. And that's the whole point. My training was actually as a neuroscientist, so I'm fascinated by the brain. And I'm actually totally OK if I, if I kind of look like this, as long as my brain is functioning 100%. Like, I just want to be able to read a book when I go to sleep and remember what I read about. And if that's the last day that I'm alive, it's fine, but I just want to be cognitively there. I want to remember who I am and that I'm functioning well. So that's what my lab focuses on, is this sort of cognitive resilience, keeping your cognition um, going. And we're sort of trying to, to figure out, OK, why is this so important? And it turns out that we all think about youth and we all think about disease, for example, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. But it turns out it's not bimodal. There's not these two sort of separate things. It's a continuum. And what people are finding is as we get older, right, there's this cognitive decline. And as you have this cognitive decline, that's where all of a sudden you start seeing people with Alzheimer's disease. So even if you have a genetic mutation, when you're 20, you don't have Alzheimer's. You're going to get it. But you don't have it at the time, at least not by cognitive testing. So something about our young brain can fight this, even at a genetic level. It's, it's healthy and young enough that it can fight it. So your body naturally knows how to keep you young. 
So the idea is how do we reverse that? How do we go back to it? And what we believe is that if we're able to not necessarily change lifespan, so let's keep you still at you know, 90 years old, but if we can change sort of the amount of time that you're healthy, right, we can actually prevent and slow down onset of these diseases. Now it's crazy because if you just extend this idea of health span by five years, you're like breaking the healthcare system. I mean, you're, you're basically completely transforming the world in terms of how much cost healthcare is, is promoting, right? So any therapeutic that can tackle any age-related condition is gonna have a huge outcome. And that's what we're thinking. We're, we're really tackling things like Alzheimer's by studying aging, because that's what we know the least about. There's absolutely no therapeutics whatsoever for this type of problem. So that's why we're focusing on it. Now, what, I, what do I mean by cognitive decline? So I like this example. So I'm, I'm still a relatively young faculty. Um, usually most faculty are, are much more senior. And what that means is that they've amassed a, lot, a, lo a much larger amount of money in their bank accounts than I have, and they all have like the newest Tesla and the best Tesla. I do not, but I will. Um, so <laughs> let's, <laughs> so for me, you'll find my car really easy because it's the only one that's not a Tesla. But let's pretend that I already made it and I have one of these Teslas and I come in in the morning, I'm gonna park it in parking lot, and my brain has to remember where on earth my car is with respect to all these other Teslas. So it's gonna do one of, a few things actually, and it does it naturally, and when you're young it does it well. You come in, I'm at the Parnassus Heights campus, so I, can, I have a really nice view of the Golden Gate Bridge and the parking structure. Um, usually there's some sort of food truck nearby that I sort of scope out when I'm hungry, and you know, usually you know, there's some sort of, we have a lot of pride and there's a lot of like murals and things, so there's some other thing for, in, the, in this particular example, a rainbow flag. Your brain's gonna take that in, and it's gonna remember where your car is with relation to those sort of cues around the room. You come back after, whatever, 16, 18 hours of working, and it's gonna guide you directly to that car. Now, if, if I could afford this house, it would be red, just so that everyone can see that I have it. Um, so this is sort of normal cognitive you know, function. As you get older, and I know this firsthand because of all of you know, the people that are like 80 um, that are driving near me, you're gonna see these people with like their car alarms. They're gonna be like walking around the parking lot trying to use their car alarm to find their car. That is your brain on aging. That is natural cognitive decline. It will happen to everyone, right? So this is the type of decline that precedes then disease. It's your, something in your brain is becoming vulnerable and then you get the disease. So there's this transition period that I think we can actually target. I can't really manipulate humans in a, in a very intense way. So we always have to go through preclinical studies, right? We can't just do things in, in humans. There's correlations, but there's not really like, until you have the therapy and you try it in a trial, you have to discover it and you go through discovery platforms. So we use preclinical models. We use rodent models um, here. So just like finding that Tesla in a parking lot, we teach these mice or these rodents to find a hidden platform and we put cues around the room. Now this works really well because they're scared of water, but they're really good natural swimmers. So we put them in this pool of water and they wanna get out of the cold water as fast as possible and really quickly they learn, oh, I can get out by finding this platform and they use those cues. Now, when they get older, for example, we do most of our young studies in someone that's like in their mid-20s. I mean, that's the best you can do. Now, when we look at a mouse that would be the equivalent of like 65, right around retirement age, they'll find the platform just like an old person will find the car, but they make a lot more mistakes. It's just not as good as a young animal. Now, we're using really basic tasks that are still working the same way, and we can ask, okay, What's making a young animal go old? Can we make a young animal old and then find things we can target? Or can we make an already old mouse act young? And if so, are there things we can increase um, in order to do that? So I'm zooming in right now and I'm gonna get a little, a little technical. So we all have like tons of regions in our brain, but as you get old, not all your brain actually ages. People think it does, it actually doesn't. It's very specific for particular regions. Once you get disease, all hell breaks loose and then everything sort of just, you know, goes to hell. Um, but at the beginning, there's these little regions that are really important. So that memory I told you about is encoded in one region, and here I'm just gonna put it here. It's called a hippocampus. We all have it. Um, my favorite example is like Finding Nemo, because I have like a little niece, and I've watched that like 2,000 times. Um, poor little Dory that just doesn't remember anything, that's the same region. That's the one that everyone thinks about. That's the example. Um, when you get older, that's what's happening, like Dory, basically. Um, so that's what we're focusing in on. Now, there's a bunch of things that happen. Now, when people say you're getting old, everyone thinks your cells are dying, your brain's just not working anymore. That's not true. Your cells die 
when you get disease. So if anyone tells you your cells are dying, they're not. They're changing and they're becoming impaired, but they're not dying. Now this region is really, I think, cool because it's one of the few regions that still has stem cells in it. Most of your body loses its stem cells, but there's little pockets that still remain. There's some in the hippocampus. Um, the other thing is like there's huge immune system. Before people thought the immune system doesn't work in the brain, they were wrong. It does work in the brain. And it turns out it's really good to just keep you young. Now when you're getting old, your stem cells start working, you have huge inflammation, and all of a sudden it's going to change your cells just in the way they look and function. Now this is an actual picture right here that I'm showing you guys of a brain cell, a neuron. And this is actually, each one of these little thorn-like structures, that's where they're communicating. All of your memory, who you are, what you remember, your background, your dreams, everything is encoded in little thorn-like structures that look like that. Everything, everything that you are is a series of sort of firing patterns based on those guys. As you get older, your cells are there, you're losing those connections. That's ultimately what's happening. Now what we thought was interesting is all the players are there. There's little pockets of cells you can still bring back. All of those neurons are there, those cells are there. Is there some way we can just bring back their structure, bring back somehow their function? And we, you know, in thinking about it when I was starting my lab, the brain is not the only thing that ages. Everything ages, right? Your liver ages. We can't drink as much when we get older. Um, and we started thinking, what connects everything together? Well, you know, liver, eyes, brain. And the idea we started thinking about was sort of more organismal, right? We wanted to know what could, could affect aging, not just in the brain, but everywhere. And the idea we came was everything is connected through our blood system. Your blood is what gives life to everything. Now, how could we manipulate blood? You know, we can't take a genetic approach. You know, people are talking about CRISPR and making CRISPR babies, and it's crazy, but that's one or two genes at a time. We're talking about your entire blood system. How do we change it? So we actually went back in time, and we used a really old technique from like the 1600s, and it's a technique called parabiosis. So we basically are attaching two animals together, such that two bloodstreams are, are, are basically two hearts are sharing one bloodstream, one mixed bloodstream. So we can mix the old into the young and the young into um, the old. This is pretty Frankenstein, although I, I promise you the animals within like two weeks are doing really well. We've let them live their whole life, which is over two years. We can separate them, and then if you separate them, you have to keep them together because they're bonded after about a month of being together. So they're actually, yeah. Yes. Yes. I didn't put any videos because I, I didn't know, right, the, like the group, so I just put cartoons, but yes. Yeah, not on here, but yeah, I do. I, I mean, they're actually, they're pretty cute. Um, their tails kind of like entwine like this, and they learn to walk together. We, <laughs> we, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy technique, but it's a powerful technique. And one thing I want you guys to take out of this is we're using a crazy old technique, and now we're applying cutting-edge technology on this background, and this is how we think we're like going to push forward therapeutics, right? So we're not afraid of going back and then pushing it forward. So we, you, know, you can ask a few questions. One is this idea of like anti-aging factors that everyone gets crazy about, and that's definitely one approach, and I'm going to talk about that today. But the thing that people forget and people need to remember is we also have these aging factors that are accumulating. We can make molecules to block them. That's another way of making something young again. So it's not just one strategy. There's multiple strategies, right? And in my lab, I tell people we have to tackle things from different angles because we don't know what's going to work, right? So that's the way we approach it. So the main thing, and I'm going to share with you two stories uh, on, on how we're trying to do this, where we are. Um, one of them is this idea of these anti-aging factors. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of, uh, sort of a little bit of insight into what's going on inside of it. So here I'm showing you some stem cells in red, okay? And this is an old animal. This is the old brain, a few stem cells. You expose this animal with this model to young blood. All of a sudden, you can start sprouting new neurons. And this can happen also in the humans. Now what's interesting is, this is going to reflect itself in better learning. This is going to reflect itself in sort of ability to find that car, ability to find that platform. So what we did then is um, we wanted to look how far could we reverse aging. We're taking an old animal and new stem cells, but it's not like those cells were there the whole time. What about cells that have been there the whole time? So we went back to this idea of those thorns I talked to you about, those connections. This is an old animal, and you can see it's pretty stripped of those connections, but somehow those connections are still there. The memory in the neurons is still there. You can bring it back. And all of a sudden, you can bring back tons of these connections. So you're taking a cell 
that was old. This would be the equivalent of a human that's 65 to 70. And somehow, by just giving it young blood, you can make it look young again. You can bring back those connections. Yes. No, so what, we're, so what we're finding is you can actually sort of pinpoint if you do sort of studies over time, and you're actually bringing back the same types in the same places. I, I, don't, I can't tell you whether it's like coming back. It's just going back into the same place. So we can tell you at least where that connection was made is coming back. Uh, so the cool thing about this, right, is that the, the memory is actually in your genes, right? We all have these sort of gene expression patterns, and that's where your memory is. Your memory is actually sort of, so it's, it's the genes that are then going to cause this neuron to fire. I mean, I mean Oh, yes. Yes. It could relearn again. Yeah, we haven't done like recall. So I don't know whether like if they had a memory when they were like three months old, do, can we bring it back when they're two years? Yeah. Yes. So although, I mean, at this point, I, I won't say no to anything at this point. You just don't know. No, they're really dynamic. So they're in the same spot, but they're, they will go, they'll go like this. So they're in the same spot, but they'll do this. Yeah, so they'll retract, they'll go out, they're like still, the, the other neurons are still going to connect to it, but there'll be moments where you don't want a strong connection, and there's moments where you do want a strong connection. So they're very dynamic over time. Whoa, so many questions, yeah. Yeah. Uh, old, like old uh, rats have more memory storing their neocortex. Yep. Does that affect memory from the so past? We think one of the reasons that the hippocampus is like the first place to go awry is that it serves as a filter. It's like a gateway. So there's tons of information, but you don't need all the information. I only need to remember a bridge, you know, flag, and taco truck, and I can get to my car. So that hippocampus is going to take that information, it's going to process it, it's going to sort of refine it, that those are the three things you need, then it's going to score it in the neocortex, right? And then when, or in the entorhinal cortex. Then when you, you need to recall it, it goes back through that hippocampus. So we're basically not saying, a lot of the parts in the brain, like what you're talking about, that region, they're not as impacted by aging. It's really these sort of like filters and gateways that seem to be the most susceptible. So I think that's why we can actually bring back on and off some of these memories. Yeah. Do you believe neurogenesis is actually occurring? Because it's, like, it's, it's controversial. Back and forth. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like the site that people think is occurring is actually in the hippocampus, which would be kind of funny if that's the one that gets affected the most. Is there a linkage to that? Yeah, so it's super controversial right now. Oh, uh, yeah. So right now we know that there are stem cells up to about almost a teenage year. Um, there's tons of groups that have done crazy studies that have shown that there's still stem cells in older people in this region. Now there's studies that have put that into question and go, no, 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 we don't actually find them. Unfortunately, we can't, like I said, experiment with humans. So this is really conflicting now. There's groups in Europe and New York that say yes, groups here on the West Coast that say no. What we do know is that, at least for our interventions, the, what, what we're looking at is every hallmark of aging. So young blood is affecting the stem cells, but it's also affecting these neurons that have been there forever. It's also affecting, it's affecting everything. Every hallmark we've looked at so far can be reversed by something in your blood. So for this, these experiments, it's not as important because it's a collective effect. For other studies, absolutely, it's like. A big is it deal. is it all the neurons that get affected, or is it like the granule cells, or like is it? So, no, we've we've looked at both. Like these are really technical. Sorry, this is both granule, pyr pyramidal, um, all of them, CA1, CA3, two, yeah, yeah. So it's across the board. Any anything that we've seen is impaired can be reversed, but we don't get like a boost above it, which would be really bad. You can only restore it back to what you had when you were young. Um, with these particular interventions. Okay, so really quickly, we want to do behavior because that's what I'm interested in. You cannot do behavior in two animals that are connected. We tried it and you can't do it, don't try it. So we came up with a different approach, which was just taking that blood, removing the cells, taking the factors, and just injecting it. So you can do a series of injections into a mouse of this young blood, then you can perform behavior. And remember, these animals are really impaired. So just look at the gray one for me, and this is just number of errors, and I put a little schematic there just so you guys can see Normally, they know exactly where their platform is, and they can go straight to it. A young animal would do that. Old animals just don't, so they make more mistakes. We're just counting the number of mistakes that they're making before finding it. 
And an old animal, I mean, it's, it's not very good at finding them. You give, some of these were actually like brothers from, of them. Um, you give them young blood and all of a sudden they're performing really well. Not as good as a young animal, but really, really good. Probably about 80% of the way that a young animal would be. So we knew all of a sudden you can take an old brain, an old animal, it's impaired, give it young blood, you get back to memory that looks like probably like a 35-year-old or so. So we got super excited about this um, here. Exactly. We took old into old, and we took young into old, yeah. And remember, these are injections. I get a little bit worried when they say transfusions, because then people think we're like hooking up, or then humans want to hook themselves up. Um, this was actually the stuff, there was a, like an episode, it was called Blood Boy on Silicon Valley, that like had this, it's, it's literally, I promise you, it's actually based on this stuff. It's really weird when people are like, like emailing me these things, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Um, like the Colbert Report, Daily Show, they all looked at this sort of stuff and did exactly what people would think, right? Which is, let's get it into humans. The FDA just made an announcement, like just made an announcement, right? Like, you can't do this. We're doing this in an animal short term. People want to hook themselves up for like 20 years. It's not viable. It, it can actually hurt like even lung pressure. And then there's very little regulation, right? So the whole idea is the concept is there. People around the world now have seen it, and they've seen it in multiple tissues, bone, muscle, brain. So we know that idea is true. However, you can't just infuse yourself, right? That's where sort of the next step comes, which is what is causing this, right? What is doing this that we can then mimic, and then we can make it into a drug? You need something targetable. You have to target it somehow. And that's what my lab is trying to do. And we're taking two approaches. Um, there's two things that are happening. You can either identify the stuff in the blood, or you can figure out what on earth is happening in the brain. So you can either make a molecule to repeat what's happening in the brain, or you can find the compound, make it synthetically, put it back into the blood. So those are the two sort of approaches we see. So the first one is, wh what about in the brain? Let's figure out what's going on in the brain. Maybe we can target that. And what we decided to do is, we looked at genetics, right? This is sort of the era of genomics, right? We can do so much. We can sequence everything. Everyone does 23andMe. So we know this is much simpler now. <laughs> So that's what we did. We basically just looked at the whole genome in the hippocampus region and asked what is changing. And we did it across aging, what are we losing, and we did it after young blood exposure, what are we gaining. And what was really interesting is not a lot of things were changing. <laughs> it was actually only a couple hundred genes that were changing. What was really interesting about it is that they were all master regulators. They were all hubs. So we, for those that don't know, there's these things called transcription factors, which is basically one gene that can, that can control hundreds, if not more, of genes. And a lot of the things that we saw changing in these brains were those master regulators. And we focused in on one, which is known as CREB. It's been involved in learning and memory before, so we thought it's a good candidate. And what we wanted to know is we can only target something if we know it's important for the effect we see. So what we wanted to do is can we block some of these regulators and see does it block the effect of blood? If it does, that's a really good target to pursue, right? You have to have some sort of meaningful information. So we took advantage of gene therapy. We can manipulate any gene and any tissue by putting it in a virus and either taking it out, putting it back in. I mean, people can do crazy things now with viruses. Um, I mean, this is one of the worries that people have, actually, about the ethics of it. But for this, we can. And we decided to just use gene therapy and block that master regulator, put young blood in, and go, what happened? Now, this is the data I showed you with, like, you know, okay, there's a really great effect by young blood. This is what happens if you block it. It's not completely blocked, but it's about a 50% block, which means it's really, really important for this. So what we wanted to know is say, okay, what about if we eliminate blood? Are there things that we can do to just sort of activate CREB itself, right? Can we give something systemically? Can we still inject something, a compound perhaps, elicit CREB, and maybe that's what causes learning and memory to happen. But in order to sort of do that, we need to be able to have a platform, uh, sort of a way of seeing if CREB actually gets activated in a living animal. So we started coming up with discovery platforms. And this is where like, my students and I got into a room, and we started thinking, we have to keep this animal alive, we have to put something in the brain, and we have to see if it's dynamic in response to some of these things. Um, and what we decided to do is we used CREB as our readout, and we said, how can we figure out if it's active or not? And we ended up using, you guys know fireflies, right? Everyone's seen fireflies, and it emits this light. We don't produce, obviously, that light. So we engineered a way that every time this master regulator is sort of acting, 
it'll, it emits that light, the same light from a firefly. And that way we can just inject whatever we want. We can image an animal and go, does it emit the firefly protein or not? Does it emit the light or doesn't it? And this is sort of what, what it looks like. So we did gene therapy. We injected that sort of reporter here. You can see it. And every time that you see this sort of pixel area, that's light that we're actually detecting. Blue is low, red is high. And this is what we were able to do. This is baseline. This is after we actually give it blood treatment. So we actually have something that you can see gets hotter, right? It actually starts eliciting more light. So right now what we've done is we've started then looking at blood factors and just profiling it this way, right? We're at much smaller lab than some of the bigger labs are. We're less than 10 people in my lab. So we have to come up with really different ways of trying to uh, tackle a really big problem just because you know, we have to be more targeted because we're smaller. We have a couple of really interesting candidates um, right now. I, I, I can't tell you guys about it yet because UCSF told me I can't. But, <laughs> but there's some like, really interesting, uh, we have about three compound or three factors that we found this way. Right now, we've only tested one of them with behavior and that shows promising. We haven't tested the other two. Um, but at least it seems like our platform is able to discover some of these um, things. What we're doing is we're now validating anything we discover through this discovery platform, we can validate now in human blood. So we have collaborations at UCSF with the Memory and Aging Center. They give us young and old people blood. Everything we find here, we look in their blood and we're only pursuing things that actually go away in the blood of humans. So we go back and forth to try and really, you know, we want to try and get the right factors. Now, how am I doing in time? I have one small little story. I can stop if you want. Or is that okay? One yeah. small little story? Okay. So that's one intervention, blood. And the FDA already brought up this idea that we don't know if it works in humans and we have to do more tests in them before we figure out whether it works in humans. So let's try and discover things. So that, that's where parabiosis and sort of this, this idea of young blood comes in. But it's not the only thing that's been shown to reverse signs of aging. It turns out things like caloric restriction, we hear about this all the time, that can do it. Things like exercise are also really beneficial. They can also reverse things, uh, signs of aging. It turns out that there have been clinical trials on exercise. So if you actually take Alzheimer's patients, you exercise them, they can actually slow down cognitive decline and even see improvements in it. The problem is people that are older are frail. You can't do it. All of us are young and we can do exercise. Old people can't. So one of the people in my lab asked, well, is there some way that we can give the benefit of exercise to an old person that's never exercised, because we know it's gonna be good for them. And that's the next thing we sort of pursued here. So a little bit about exercise. Just to show you guys that it's comparable to what we see in young blood, you can actually put a little mouse on a running wheel, has to be voluntary, cannot be forced, okay? So you have to want to exercise. Um, and you see this benefit again. We see more stem cells using that same task I showed you. This is an old mouse, not very good. This is a mouse after it's exercised. Obviously it's much better. And people. Everyone knows this. You go running, you feel more clarity, and you have like, a lot more energy, and you're sharper. So we're seeing this in these old animals. Now this is what we wanted to know. Can we take the blood of, of uh, an animal that exercised, transfer it to an animal that never exercised, and can we make it look like it exercised, at least at a cognitive level, right? <laughs> and this is not doping. I want to point this out. This is, this, this is taking the factors of this blood. Um, so what did we see? So it was, it was pretty crazy. We used the same paradigm we did for young blood. Okay, so it's a one month treatment. And we took a, a, an animal that just, that never ran, right? Both of these animals never ran. This one just got old regular blood. This one got the runner. Again, we saw more stem cells. And then we did the learning and memory task. And again, they're making a lot less errors. Yeah. Yeah. No, so we're taking advantage of, of like natural behavior, like as scientists, right? It's better to use natural behaviors and not artificial ones. They're just really curious and they, they, they normally go kilometers. I mean, these guys can run kilometers every night. And we have like Bluetooth technology that just measures everything, so we have all of it. So there's no reason, it's just that it's, it's Natural it's will. It, they just, normally they forage and they're just naturally gonna run. I mean, we should want to run technically humans. I just, I don't, but we, sh we should want to. Um, okay, so this is sort of, you know, sort of one more way in which we're going. Really quickly, I just wanted to say, okay, we now know we can rejuvenate the brain in a few ways. I wanted to highlight work by other people, you know, work from Stanford and Berkeley and Harvard has looked at muscle. People are looking at bone. 
They've looked at liver, they've looked at pancreas. They've looked, I mean, there's probably eight different tissues now where you can actually reverse repair, healing, learning, regeneration across tissues. So there really is something about it. So I know with, especially as people talk about and people give FDA warnings, which I'm really happy about, people sometimes lose interest. What I want to point out is there's a lot of evidence around the world for the last like 100 years now that signs of aging can be reversed. We think we can actually target it through blood factors, which makes it a really nice approach because you don't have to like stick things into the brain. Um, and with that, yeah, main thing is you can do it. And these are just some of my lab members that have been here or that have moved on since then. It's a bunch of just young people um, with really great ideas. And that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, so I have two questions for you. Yeah. Um, number one, how did you narrow it down to focusing on just the hippocampus? So I guess this question is related to like how much, um, I, let me pose it a different way. So like how does this scale with more complex tasks mm -hmm. and like how much does working memory degrade in comparison to like uh, encoding into like long-term memory and that sort yep. of thing? No, that, those, are, those are great questions. So just like that sort of continuum that I showed you guys at the beginning, the brain's the same way. So when we're young, youngish, right, we start getting sort of impairments in the filtering of the system. That's where the hippocampus is. Where your memories are encoded long term is much more resilient, actually. It's much, it's much more dynamic. If anything, I told you guys those connections were dynamic. If anything, in the other regions, they're going too fast. You're making, they're, they're on and off way too much. So there you have to actually slow them. Um, We've seen from our interventions, particularly in exercise now, um, which seems to be really robust, you can also reverse signs, uh, at least at a cellular and genomic level, in other regions of the brain, not just the hippocampus. It's just that this is the most translatable one to humans, and it's the one that we know is the earliest on. Some of the tests they actually give, even for neurological scoring, are actually really basic, simple tests. Those are the first ones that you can actually start seeing that there's problems. We think if we can um, sort of target that timing, we'll be able to eliminate sort of these further impairments that you're talking about, but absolutely. Um, in terms of the mice, we've expanded this to a bunch of other um, types of tasks that are, that are harder, different mazes, things like how well do you, are you able to forget this memory and make a new memory, you know, so different types of things that would be more to us. We haven't gone into like crazy like virtual reality type tasks because they're just, they take months to train. Our old animals will be dead before they can actually like learn it. Um, sorry, oh. the second question, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm being selfish here. Um, second question was just like, is, have you looked at it from like a systems perspective? So like, if you're upregulating this part of the system, does that have effects, I guess, um, in other regions where you would expect there to be like down regulation or something, and it's just not there because of aging, and you're not targeting it specifically, right? Yeah, so we've done a lot of, uh, we've also tried to do some gene therapy approaches, and what, what's really interesting, at least with some of these interventions, is that you're losing activity as you're getting older, and young blood is able to restore part of it, not even all the way, but part of it, a good part of it. Um, we've never seen a case with systemic interventions where you can actually go above where you would normally be. So we're never causing extra activity or hyperactivity in the system. We're only restoring it, or rescuing it up to some level. When we start manipulating genes in the brain, absolutely, we can get hyperactivity, and there's a whole problem with that in terms of like degeneration. But when you're approaching it from the systemic perspective, it never elicits a response that's so great that hyperactivity happens. And I thought that was just interesting biology. Yeah, we didn't do it on purpose. I, I don't think we could have if we wanted to. But it's a natural sort of good limitation to the system. Um, so, so for the hippocampus, do you think that there's long-term memory being stored there? Or do you believe the consolidation during sleep? What's your belief on it? Oh, so for, for everyone in, in, in the room, there's a lot of things that go into sort of how we remember, even in disease, there's a lot of ways that people are saying, you know, I told you guys, when you're young, your brain has a way of keeping itself young and protecting you from things like Alzheimer's. Some of it was, you know, people think is stem cells. Some of it people think is, is sleep. We're finding out that as you sleep, there's actually openings in your blood vessels that come on and it clears a lot of waste that's normally there. In the old brain, that's something else that happens that we haven't, you know, we haven't looked at. Other labs have looked at blood vessels and it also helps sprouting of blood vessels. So there's a number of different things that can affect or impact health. And all of these will affect sort of memory. That's why I don't worry about any one particular hallmark. I really think collectively it's what's happening. 
So with young blood, it's affecting absolutely blood vessels. It's affecting sort of the, in terms of affecting sleep, we've never no, tested I, I, it. I, no, my question was, um, do you think that there's long-term actual storage of memories in the synapses? Or like how long do you actually, so, do I mean, you believe that they I, are? I think, you know, dogma there is, is of course true, right? There's sort of patterns of activity and that's what, you know, memories are. And those are all encoded in higher parts of the brain. And your hippocampus is sort of a filter. The interesting thing, I think about it almost as like, old school ro Rolodexes and libraries, you know, these people had all these like I, cards with the name of the books in like these stored drawers and some old person could come and kind of look it up. I feel like the hippocampus is almost like that old person, right? It knows exactly which drawer to go and go, oh, here's the book or the memory that you wanted. That's how I see the hippocampus, okay. not as... So you don't think it's storing at all? You just think that the, it, when it die, is dying out, like the afferent connections aren't working so it's not able to retrieve stuff? I, I, I so that would get really technical for the group. So we can talk about that after, yeah, because that it, it'll get really technical there. Yeah. Uh, so, so when you're looking at um, uh, the the uh, effect of fit mice and, mm -hmm. and having um, those things kind of uh, mm -hmm. or those those uh, the same effects of, of the young uh, of young young blood, mm -hmm. uh, is, is there like a specific um, like factor that you use to measure fitness, and then if if a mouse is more fit, does it have a stronger impact? Because you said yeah. you can't get quite to the yeah. full amount, but like, does it scale with the age or the fitness of the mouse? That's really cool. Is um, the effect of exercise can be seen in young animals too, right? In young humans as well. So what we've done is we've taken the brains of young, middle, like whatever age you want. To, we've looked at it, right? And you exercise them. If you look at the distance that they ran versus the level of like new neurons or stem cells, like it is such a strong correlation. So the amount of health in the brain is correlated really strongly with the distance and the amount of exercise that you've done. So it's not necessarily a readout of fitness, but it does start pointing out the fact that these animals that were able to do this consistently and for longer end up having a bigger benefit in the brain. So it starts getting to that. What happened? Yeah, so you know, when we look at young and old, it absolutely flattens. There's only so many cells that can be in a particular place. There's only so many connections that we can make. Um, we've never seen it. We always see a plateau when you look at large number of animals. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't, in terms of the human data, they've done functional MRI. They've done um, sort of the amount of atrophy just based on like blood responses in the brain and they've seen in these older individuals that you, you can get an increase in those regions as well. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about timelines? So how long have you been running your lab and how long do you think um, until we'll start to see uh, yeah. applicability in humans both in terms of the research and yeah. um, regulation? Absolutely. Um, so I've been there a little bit over five years now. Um, in terms of clini ongoing clinical trials, there are some. Um, Stanford has a, a small clinical trial on Alzheimer's patients um, where they're, they're doing um, infusions. Barcelona has one um, on Alzheimer's disease where they're doing plasmapheresis, so they're actually like cleaning out your blood. South Korea has one on Alzheimer's disease um, as well. I want to point out the word Alzheimer's disease. So we, we cannot get a, a, a test, a trial right now on normal aging that involves things like plasmapheresis or, or whatnot. It's always been in sort of early or mild cognitive impairments all associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we'll see how much can this reverse once you have the disease. I think it still will, and I think it can. Um, so I think those will be really interesting. There's some evidence that has come out, for, um, but it's mostly like these surveys that like the caregivers take um, under some of these, and they were blinded studies where they go that the level of independence of some of these small group of humans that have received blood um, starts improving. They see more sort of independence on their part. And there was a study, I think, in Barcelona that saw um, an, a, an increase in their neurological scores. But again, they're very small and early. Um, right now, especially with the FDA recommendations, I think people are really starting to focus on how can we mimic the effect of this rather than how do we just figure out ways of sticking blood into humans. Um, there's definitely good candidates. Um, Right, for, you know, we identified a couple that your patents were filed by UCSF that have been sort of licensed by a few of the bigger companies. Right now, it's a lot of bigger companies, um, but there aren't that many. They're really, really, really difficult to find. I mean, it's like a needle in a haystack. Um, so I think that, that to me is one of the things I worry about. I, I, I think we need a lot more groups to start taking these different candidates that we have to figure out which ones are working, and then probably synergistic effects will be one of the big things to, to pursue. 
there's enough out there right now where um, I know that there's at least some clinical trials planned over the next three years for inhibitors of bad factors, things like that. Um, so I think we'll start seeing some effects. It's, none of it is on aging proper. It's on things like macular degeneration in the eye. It's on things, so it's always some other um, readout that they can get approved um, for. Yeah. Um, so there's increasing evidence that suggests that um, there may be plasma biomarkers for Alzheimer's, like tau hexapeptide. So is that, do you think that's a contributor to what you're seeing, and, and is that something that you intend to test? Um, yeah, so bi biomarkers have been great. Um, the problem is the most robust biomarkers for aging, at least, are at the genomic level. So it turns out that there's changes to your DNA, epigenetics. That's the best biomarker people have identified for like aging. For Alzheimer's, absolutely, right? We know A, beta, tau, there's all these things we hear about um, consistently. There have been studies that look at these th interventions and there's changes in some of these biomarkers as well. So I think that's also really important um, to do. In terms of targeting any particular one of them, there's been a lot of research for a long, long time trying to tackle on these biomarkers, and they've failed. Um, so I've, I've shifted my lab away, and we're one of the, probably one of fewer labs that are not tackling on tau or A-beta. We're trying to circumvent that, because we think these are probably really good biomarkers. I'm not sure if they're the true contributors to disease or disease progression. So we've actually taken the opposite approach. We've actually kind of steered away from them. Um, but that's just been a choice that, that I, I decided to, to make. We do use biomarkers like inflammation and like inflammatory molecules, but not, not the other way, yeah. So what are the biggest rate limiting factors for progress in this research and commercializing? Um, I mean, one thing I told you guys about is, you know, I have nine people, right, and we have so many candidates, and it requires a lot of manpower, a lot of technology, um, so I think resources, number one, just scaling this up is one thing that would just facilitate it, right? We have basically one factor will take us probably two years before I can tell you it's, it's a hit or it's not a hit. If we had 20 people, if we had multiple machines, if we had, does that make sense? Like it's just a, a timing bottleneck um, about it. So that's one, one thing. The other thing is you know, most of our funding is from the government. And the entire time I don't have any disease models, right? I, I didn't talk about tau or a beta, which is what people understand and clinicians understand. I'm talking about things that are just natural biology. There's a lot less funding for that from the government because how are you gonna rationalize it to taxpayers, right? They, everyone can see I wanna cure Alzheimer's, but if I try and make an argument, I wanna keep you young so that you don't get Alzheimer's, they'll never listen to me by the time I get to the so you don't get Alzheimer's part. So that's the other hurdle, is just changing the way that at least biomedical science is treating this particular type of research, right? It's just a really interesting niche that People are starting to believe more and more in, but it's still sort of high risk, high reward that they sort of shy away from. I think those are the, the two things, right? It's just making people understand this is a viable approach towards therapeutics because, because it's not a direct line to a disease, people will have a hard time seeing that. Um, and just right now the mechanisms that we do for biomedicine just aren't conducive to that kind of research. The reason I even got this, right, was that crazy position they gave me, right? Here's a billion and a half dollars, we don't care what you do do what you want, and then all of a sudden you can start pushing this forward. Um, the, you, you mentioned the small number of people and it takes two years to kind of prove out one factor. Is, is the, the two years to prove out one factor, is that parallelizable itself or just with more people? Yeah, I mean if you have 10 hits, you could go in parallel, right? The problem for us is like there's a bottleneck. There's like only one location where we can do each individual task, so we have to like do it in order rather than going, oh my god, I'm going to set up like 10 of these things at once and just start going at it. I mean, that would be like, dear, you know, National Institute of Health, I would like, you know, $20 million, please. Yeah, it's like. Do you know what's the reason why blood is, is reversing aging? Another question is like, do you see other signs except like in the hippocampus, like uh, rats can remember yeah. more? And does the old blood, <laughs> like does the young rat become old yeah. because of the old? Yeah, so I'll start with that. Um, absolutely, old blood makes a young animal older. It, and it does it in the brain, it does it on the skin, it does it in like 
sliver of the muscle. Yes, there is an active signal as you're getting older in your blood that is promoting age, for sure. Um, and then there's these young factors, right? Just so you know, if you take away the young blood in our hands over a few months, like the effects go away. So we don't know if we need to reboost it to keep it going. If you give old blood to a young animal, you can come back half a year later. They still have, they're getting better, they're recovering, but they still have some of the hallmarks of age. So that gives you two approaches, right? I talked to you, I told you guys, I talked to you guys about these anti-aging factors, and everyone's forgetting this part, that there are pro-aging factors. Turns out those are actually easier to target. We can make neutralizing antibodies against we can make small molecules that interfere with them. There's tons of stuff that is well known on how to develop them. It's the fact that it's not as catchy, right? If I go, let's target a pro-aging factor versus an anti-aging factor, people always gravitate to this anti-aging. In my lab, half the lab does one, half the lab does the other. And we even are trying to start combining it. So yeah. with pro-aging, you can find out what's causing the aging, like the aging factors, so then you can tackle back? Is that the reason why you're doing that? Exactly. So the idea for me is, you know, we, we, we've even gone into like tighter. We've identified some pro-aging factors and those have been easier to find that only affect stem cells. There's some that only affect the neurons. They're very specific in what they're doing. Some are broad, but some are specific. You know, people always ask me, what if you give young blood, are you gonna promote cancer? What if someone's gonna get cancer and you're gonna make like the tumor grow bigger? And I'm like, that's a good question. Um, so we have aging factors, right, that selectively stop cell growth. Well, all of a sudden, we can give now an anti-aging factor, and even if it does promote growth, we can introduce an aging factor, and then we can start titering it. You know, biology does it for a reason, right? It's really elegant. I mean, we're here for a reason. So we're trying to sort of listen to biology and go, what, what aspects of this do we have to copy? You know, is it one, is it two, is it a combination of the two? And we're starting to tackle that, right, in the lab, and I think that's gonna be really important. This is why I keep telling people we need more people looking into this at every level, right? Whether it be academic, whether it be in companies that are starting to look at it, you have to have a broader portfolio, I suppose, right? You have to actually tackle multiple things going forward. So you gave us an example of anti-aging. Yeah. What is an example of pro-aging? Because I had the same thought that that must be easier to tackle. So the pro-aging, we found a lot of like inflammation. There's a lot, you know, inflammation is a big deal when you get older. Um, and we found a lot of inflammatory molecules. So what we've done so far is we've done a lot of genetic studies. We can take it away, right? And we can let them get older and they're really healthy. We, it's much, it's, we haven't been able to develop yet, and this is just because it's not our expertise, um, small molecule inhibitors or neutralizing antibodies. I mean, there's entire labs and, you know, I mean, Genentech is famous for its neutralizing antibodies. That's how it, like, it made its fortune. Um, but there's a whole entire thing that goes into making them. For us, we have to do all the genetics before we're gonna spend enough money on trying to go into this big endeavor of making the small molecules. Um, but absolutely, you know, I can tell you that if you genetically target them, the animals look better. The animals perform better. What I can't tell you is we don't have a small molecule or a neutralizing antibody to put it into an old animal when it's old and tell you if you can reverse it. That I can't tell you yet, because we just haven't gone there. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> Why can't you do a simple test? Like give the give the young animals that I have now aged because of the old blood anti inflammatories and see what happens. So people, I mean, there's tons of anti inflammatory studies, even in Alzheimer's, right? People say take NSAIDs, um, non steroidal anti inflammatories, and it's actually beneficial. It can actually um, the problem is that all of these NSAIDs are very broad. Right, and what we're talking about is very specific targeting because you don't want to ruin your immune system. You can't, we can't get rid of your immune system because then you're going to die if it doesn't have a response. So these are very specific. So you have to get pretty specific targeting towards it so that you don't ruin the immune response that you need when you get a cold or you get pneumonia or things like that. But NSAIDs, there's studies, even in humans, that there is some benefit to it. Yeah, oh, so much. So, oh wait, we had a question from like a while back ago this metaphor but there may be some parallels between what your lab is doing like going rapidly like taking all these tactics like splitting up your lab into half half anti-aging you know pro-aging mm -hmm. uh and you know there's lo these long cycle times uh, but there's some parallels between uh research and entrepreneurship in the early stages when you're trying to find the idea that has product market fit how do you effectively na navigate that idea maze I mean, especially I can imagine why you're super motivated because that like end goal is great, but just like practically, how yeah. do you direct your lab to do that? 
Yeah. So because I got my start in this program, right, I was able to, at the very beginning, take a lot of high risk. So I spent that initial capital on these experiments where they were really risky. Uh, if, if, if Youngblood had done nothing, the lab would have shut down, basically. Right? I took a big risk at the beginning. Now it's easier because I have a series now of targets that I can study. And I go into you know, previous history or I, you know, I can look into like bioinformatics and see what, what is the predicted function of some of these proteins. So then I start prioritizing that way. The biggest funnel for me is fundability. Like you said, most of my funding, if not, I mean, almost all of my funding comes from the government. So I am forced to pick particular hits that align better with that particular funding source because I'm so attached to it. So at this point, it's a bit less creativity. What I do is I siphon money. So I get the money, don't look at this NIH, I get the money from, <laughs> from the government, right? And then I spend part of it on the factor that I think the, you know, they'll be interested in. And then I take a large chunk of that and I put it into things that are riskier or proteins that maybe no, you know, there were some that no one has ever looked at ever, ever. There's proteins in our bodies that people have never looked at, right? Of course I'm going to go after that one in, you know, in my lab in preclinical stuff. Of course I am. Maybe that's why it hasn't, you know, been figured out. I basically Robin Hood it. I, you know, steal from that pot to put into this pot. So that's how I do it. The other thing is I have always pursued and found a way of pursuing what is unknown. If there is a factor, if there is a protein where there's like a handful of publications, there's another one with like 400, I will always, if I have to choose, prioritize that one. I've fallen flat plenty of times, but every once in a while, there's some that work out and it's really cool. So I always prioritize that. But that's just personal preference. And I think it comes from my, like my life, right? I wasn't supposed to be here from where I came from. It's always been a series of risks. I run the lab in the same way. And I'm not afraid of, if I were to epically fail, they kicked me out of UCSF. I was so much more successful than anyone ever thought I was even supposed to be. I'm good. Like, I'll, it's fine. I'll teach somewhere. Like, it's, it's fine. Like, I'm happy. So it sounds like you're taking very strategic risks. Or at least you're, you think you're at least a little bit better at taking those risks, and then you go and do it. I, I'm betting that I'm clever. <laughs> and that I can, I, yes, I'm betting on, on that I'm clever. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way. I hope hubris doesn't catch me someday. But yeah, you know, I have half of it I'm forced to go the, the sort of traditional route, and then I'm trying to siphon tons of funds towards the not so conventional route. Um, you mentioned the epigenetic factors being part of the aging stuff. Um, I'm wondering how much you do epigenetic sequencing on these mice, or, and also like in a human context, like there's things out there trying to say like this is your true age based on your epigenetic sequence. Like what, what's your concept of that? Is it interesting, is it useful? Horse, we like that epigenetics, right? Like, like I, I'm always gonna try and, like, I, I, I'm gonna try, yes, right? I'm gonna tackle everything if I can. And it's, so far we've been able to try and do this. Yes, we've looked at epigenetics. So there's this theory right now that methylation, which is a form of sort of epigenetics, right? Marks on your DNA that can shut off or turn on tons of genes. So methylation is this big one. And people have shown that you can take like blood cells or skin cells, measure the methylome, the sort of landscape of this, and I can say, you're 23, I'm 37, um, I, chronologically, and it's really good and repetitive. But that is not biological age, okay? Biological age and chronological age are very different. And I'm talking about biological age, right? There's people that are gonna be 90 years old and are gonna be more cognitively fit than I will be at 50, right? So that is your biological age in my mind, your fitness. There's no marker for that yet. I can't, I can't take your blood and say you're going to be a super ager. Um, but we also don't know if you're going to be able to live 110 years, right? So there's that component of it. But yes, we've looked at epigenetics. We found that a lot of changes in sort of a, I would say it's like a cousin of methylation. There's tons of reactions that happen, and it's one that's related. It's called hydroxymethylation. We found changes there. It's a much more specific mark. It's not as broad. It only affects a subset of genes. When you give young blood, that's the mark we see changes on, on the landscape. And it's only on genes that are involved in like plasticity. So it's kind of interesting that way. Um, and we've started tweaking with it. Um, it's not as big as, as the effects of blood, but it does have benefit when you start tweaking it. But you have to get in the brain. I didn't quite follow the, the biological versus chronological. Like if you have factors on the transcription factor isn't that making a biological difference so yeah but remember that if I take a 60 year old and I take another 60 year old 
this 60 year old may be more frail. This, so their transcriptional profile, everything about them will be less sort of protective versus this other 60 year old that's very fit. They'll look very differently. So if I were to look at just their genes and ask the genes, how old do you think it is? It might tell me that they're 40, but they're actually not. Chronologically, they've been on Earth for 60 years. It's just that their body is looking or reflective of a younger state. And this is natural in a population. We all acknowledge this, right? There's these people that just look like they never age. And there's these people that you ask them, and they're like 30, and you're like, wow, like you had a rough life. There's biology <laughs> to that. There is, there's biology to that, yeah. And that's where you have to think about the age in which your body is functioning versus the amount of time you've been on Earth. But why don't you have mothers biologically? I, 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 Wouldn't that be obvious? <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, what are they? Like, what, you know, <laughs> like, right? Like, the only way I can tell, I can tell you, like, you're functioning. I can take a list of, like, grip strength, and I can say, well, based on your grip strength, you look as good as this general population, um, but it won't, we don't have enough of them, you know, because you may function cognitively like you're 40, but your bones may be really bad, or you may look wrinkly and you look like you're, you know, 95, but your bone density is really great. So it's not, we have a really hard time throughout the whole body. You know, we have a better chance tissue to tissue because aging is everywhere, right? It's everywhere and every tissue responds differently. I mean, it's a complicated problem. Yeah. My name is Bjorn, I'm a, a doctor and I have that kind of perspective when you're talking, I'm trying to understand what this would mean yeah. in a human Absolutely. perspective. Absolutely. So want. I wanted to ask you about the effect size Yes. Because you had these graphs yes. uh, and you had pictures that showed that someone like went directly to the platform and someone yeah. else looked five times yeah. for the platform, yeah. which kind of gave me the idea that the effect of these experiments was quite big. Yeah. But c could you try to explain how big, like could you verify for me if that effect of the experiment was big or actually fairly small but detectable? Great question. And the um, other, the other follow-up question yeah. is just, like, how would that effect size translate to a human mm -hmm. looking in the parking lot for their car? Mm -hmm. and, and third, like, if you compare the effect of your experiment to the effect of exercise mm -hmm. or intellectual training, like doing crossword puzzles every night, like, where is this effect this size? Fantastic. Okay, so let's, let's see if I remember everything. Okay, so there's the recency effect. So the last one was, how does, okay, how does it compare? What's the magnitude of the effect? Um, so we've run, I, I, I obviously like condensed this because the audience is broad, right? So we had tons of extra controls. So we've put young animals in there with young blood and old blood. Um, basically, the young mice are three months. It's the equivalent to someone in their mid-20s. And these animals that were normally 18 to 20 months, which was the equivalent of 65, are performing more like a, a six-month-old, which would be probably someone late 30s. Um, so late 30s is still not as sharp as like a 22 to 24-year-old. I mean, just you just know. But it's, I mean, it's a hell of a lot better. Um, in our hands, the effect of exercise are stronger than the effects of young blood, um, as far as we can tell. And then the last one was, how do they compare with something like intellectual stimulation? So obviously you can't do that with these guys, but you can do environmental enrichment, which is just a different type of sti stimulation that's not based on physical activity. We've never looked in terms of blood on that. Yeah. Um, so life expectancy has been going up the past, you know, for for a long time, except for opiate uses. Um, but people apparently in, since the 1800s have been like, once they hit adulthood, they actually has plateaued. Um, have you looked at like long term um, whether humans are actually aging faster or shorter yeah. than our predecessors who probably had healthier diet diets and lifestyles? Yeah. So I'm going to make a distinction between aging and lifespan because they're different. So lifespan is the amount of time right that we're on Earth. And there's maximum lifespan, and then there's mean or average lifespan. So average lifespan has dramatically increased due to the advent of like antibiotics and everything else. So as a whole, the population has um, gotten older. Maximum lifespan has not. So the number of people that are sort of in the higher population, sure, and we're freaking out about the baby boomers, right? Um, but maximum, there seems to be like a hard hit. One reason we believe that is there is a genetic component to aging. We, there are genes we can tweak and we can make some of these animals live longer. There's mutations in humans that are associated with 
centenarians, people that live over 100. So we know there's a genetic component. So people think there is this hard hit due to genes that's sort of capping the max. Some people believe you can extend it, some people don't. My research focuses, like I said, more on the amount of time, given whatever constraint you're under genetically, we just wanna make sure we compress that decline to the shortest possible, um, but it's, it's not looking at lifespan. There were some studies a long time ago, I think almost 100 years ago, there's no data, it's all descriptive, right, because it's 100 years ago, where they said they sewed mice together and they showed that they lived longer. That could be an injury response because they are attached to someone else and maybe they just, we know they're gonna just heal better than them. But there is some evidence that it could modulate something like that. We've never tested it. Yeah. I mean, it's a crazy experiment, so if we wanted to do it. So, you know, you mentioned that kind of like bandwidth is a constraint on, on kind of like compressing the time for this kind of thing and, and kind of like securing funding for this because it's not necessarily the, like the, Type, the type of thing that the NIH kind of like pattern matches to as being, you know, something to put a lot of money into. But it seems to me that, you know, as you alluded to earlier, there's probably a lot of private interest in this kind of research. And so, like, is there some way, and I don't know much about like the research yeah. funding model, but is there some way that you could secure funding from, from that market? Because it seems like even yeah. like the $20 million number you mentioned earlier would be like relatively easy to get in that yeah. market. Um, yeah, so there, 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 there have been startups that have, that have started, um, but not necessarily in the same way. Let's see, what, what's the best answer to give? Um, I have so little familiarity with starting a business that it's been this nebulous cloud that I acknowledge and then just kind of go, wow, that's overwhelming. And then I kind of ignore that it's there again. Um, kind of like I just put the covers over my head. Absolutely. Now that I've had my lab for a while and that I've done some consulting for a number of companies here in the Bay Area, I can totally see how I could go faster by just sort of starting something or, absolutely. It's just been such a different, you know, I, I focused on starting this one venture and it was really hard to even consider this other one. And it's not until now, and probably because my husband's about to graduate and he's like, well, what am I gonna do? I don't know, like he, he got his PhD while I was doing this fellow, it was this sort of like life. So now I'm talking to him and going, you know, there's this thing called, you know, starting a company, I have no idea how it works. So for me, I've just never allowed myself to think about how would you even go about taking this as a novice into that space. So for me, that's been the limitation. It's just sort of this confusing thing. Um, I, I thought it was kind of cool I was coming here because I figured, oh, these guys are all like somewhere in between the last and the new. I wonder, like, you know, it'll be interesting to get their insight on. It's, this is biotech and it's not the same, but that's the main limitation for me. Um. So the question here is, you said there are a couple of patents that larger institutions have licensed from UCSF. But I also know for a fact, because I'm an investor in those companies, that there are a lot of opportunities for startups who want to actually spend the next 10 years in this space um, to, to build things. So if you could just speak to some of that, because that would interest the community yeah, here. Like, I, what are some of the opportunities? What are some of the things that you're seeing um, in the startup ecosystem, yeah. not the larger yeah. corporation one? I, absolutely. So, you know, for, for example, for us, right? Like, we identify and we've done these discovery things that aren't published, no one even knows about them, right? For example, the exercise thing is a newer thing. People have focused on young blood, haven't even looked at memetics for other things, right? That's a completely different you know, field. So much extra like experiments you could do, different ages, everything. So that's a completely different area where you could do. Number two is starting to link things together. You know, for the exercise, we had access to some human blood because someone put Fitbits on elderly people and they just recorded their activity. And then we could actually go now and start looking at these elderly humans and looking at our candidates and going, are they there in humans? You know, that could be a partnership with technology that we could start, you know, all of a sudden you could take tons of hits and start funneling them down by just starting to do comparisons and things like that. Um, some of the startups that are starting, um, uh, AI, right, machine learning, that's a big one. There's, there's new companies that are starting to do, I can think of at least three, that are trying to apply machine learning towards identifying biomarkers towards identifying um, therapeutics. Is there some way I can look at a tissue and know it's blank age? So that's something where it's definitely starting. Um, a lot of the sort of blood-based companies um, have focused on sort of immune cells, or sorry, immune molecules, and they focus specifically on something, you know, like Alzheimer's disease or a disease. 
So that's another area where they've been. Um, the other companies have looked at some of these genes that promote lifespan, and they've tried to make memetics on them to see whether that can also be. So those are sort of the traditional ones. But oh my god, we, we came up just together on so many like different aspects that we can do, right? Like people are just not, the anti-aging thing has been one thing, but the pro-aging thing is really not being looked at very much. There's this entire immune component that people aren't really looking at. There's this partnership with technology that I think could really be great. Um, even how do we recruit more elderly people to be able to even figure out which of these candidates should we be, you know, people are going after candidates without even knowing, are they actually changing? There's actually people that are running a lot, right? Can we just gather them, get their information? You know, 23andMe has done amazing things with information, right? Because they have it. We don't have that information in this field. How do we get that? And then how do we partner either with academia or industry to then take all of that, you know, blood samples, activity, MRI, I mean, whatever you have, all this information that's out there, conglomerate it together and then let me have access to some of it so that I know I'm not going to go after these 20, I'm going to go after these two because when I looked at all, these, all this information, those are the ones that popped out as well. I mean, that would make it so much easier. So I think there's a big, there's a big room and a lot of space to just play. I, I mean, this is a really new field. There's a few larger companies, that, but they started small, now they're larger companies, but it's a handful. You know, there's a lot of failure also. I think there's a lot of fear in it. There have been some aging companies, you know, not everything is gonna do well. And I think as soon as like a large one doesn't do well, then people get a little bit hesitant to sort of try their own approach. Um, I think there's so many things you can do. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about, just for a concrete example, what Spring is doing? What what? Spring is doing. Um, so I'm a consultant on that, so I have to sort of be, you know, I can't give you much more than what probably what's like, publicly known, but it's one of the few um, companies that, that people are starting to look at um, artificial intelligence, right? They're starting to look at machine learning. And there's a, a bunch of companies now that are doing it. They're all doing it for different reasons um, or in different contexts. So, you know, that's where the portfolio is um, sort of broad in that sense, right? Every company can have a different thing that they're looking at, whether it be biomarkers or, you know, diagnostics, that can get um, sort of broad. But that would be sort of where those companies are, are going, yeah. Um, has anybody been looking at just um, electrical simulation of the, the region rather than like blood-based therapy? Um, so in the context of aging, I, I'm not sure, not, not to my knowledge. Um, there are startup companies, you know, that started from Stanford that are looking at just stimulation in general using techniques such as optogenetics. Um, in the Parkinson's world, things like TMS um, are actually now even in the clinic. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of anybody who's approached me with that in mind. But it doesn't mean it's not. I just don't know about it. Yeah. Good question. Two questions. One is, would you be open to collaborating with people here if they wanted to start a company? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> OK, great. So uh, anybody who's interested, let me know, and I'll enjoy you to Saul. And then the second question is, I often hear, um, especially here in Silicon Valley, lots of people who are interested in longevity taking like some cocktail of like anti-inflammatories plus like metformin plus like vitamin B plus like B12 and so on and so forth. Do you do something like that? No. I'm one of the few people that, that see, but okay, I don't want to live forever and I've really enjoyed my life. So I'm, and I'm not that old probably, right? Talk to me when I'm like 60 or something and I'm freaking out. Um, so far, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I'm just, if, to me, it's just sort of a ride. Um, and I'm happy it, whenever it ends at this point. So I don't, I'm not looking for anything to sort of promote my lifespan. If there was something, if we got to the point where we found something that would maintain my cognitive function, I would be, I, I would be taking it. What, if it was proven and there was enough evidence that told me after like trials, this is gonna help, absolutely like that freaks me out like not having my my mind there in terms of things that extend my life though like it's just not my my thing yeah i know that's weird right like it's such a weird answer because everyone else is like calorically restricting themselves i'm not <laughs> i do wear bike helmets yeah. and i can't do winter sports because i'm californian and i've broken my knees already doing it um no so you know within reason but i'm not going to do anything crazy I like life. It's fine. Whenever I go, I go. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I hope it wasn't too technical. I hope it was, it was good level.